Holly Tabor is Associate Professor of Medicine and by courtesy of Health Research and Policy and Epidemiology at Stanford University. She's Associate Director for Clinical Ethics and Education for the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics and Co-Chair of the Ex Ethics Committee at Stanford Hospital and Lucille Packard's Children's Hospital. She is an amazing person, a good friend, and a great speaker. And with that, I introduce Dr. Holly Tabor. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I just want to start out by saying how incredibly honored I am uh, to be invited to be a part of what an amazing uh, event, which is, I hope, the first of many of conferences that will be organized by this group. Um, I'm also feeling very humbled to be among a group of such um, uh, important, distinguished, and thoughtful people thinking about these very important issues, which are very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm going to be talking um, about disability ethics and COVID-19 um, and the intersection of those and challenges and opportunities. Um, and I want to also start by saying that this is a very um, large and complicated topic, and I'm sure many people in the audience have um, many things to share about this, and it, it really um, is not possible to fully capture um, every element of this important topic and the time we have today. But what I'm going to try to touch on is talking about what is inclusive healthcare in general and why I think it's an ethical issue as a bioethicist. Um, what has the COVID-19 pandemic revealed about challenges for people with disabilities in obtaining and providing healthcare? Um, what access and equity issues have been magnified and amplified by the pandemic? And I'm also going to talk briefly about the intersection um, between the pandemic and racial injustice and police violence for, pe for disabled people. And how can this crisis be a tipping point for change and transformation? And how can people in this audience um, uh, support that change? So um, the organizers asked me to start with some questions for you to think about while you're watching. Um, uh, and the first one is people with intellectual disabilities and autism in Pennsylvania who test positive for COVID-19 die at what rate compared to other Pennsylvania residents who contract the illness? And there's several options there. Um, the second question is, according to the Office of Civil Rights, what laws protect against discrimination in ventilator triage towards people with disabilities? And um, hopefully most of the audience is um, aware of those different laws that are listed there. Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act, the ADA, the ACA, and all of the above. Question three is, according to the Ruderman Family Foundation, what proportion of Americans killed by police are estimated to have a disability? And the options are less than 10%. 25%, between 33 and 50%, and 75%. So um, before we start, I also wanted to remind people that you can ask questions on Slido. Um, so hopefully people have those instructions and, and know how to do that. Um, so I want to also start with a word about language. Um, most of what, um, like, like Pete um, described, most of what I've um, learned in the course of my um, time working on this, I have learned from um, friends and colleagues and leaders in the disability community. And as I probably don't have to tell everyone here, there's um, different preferences about what kind of language to use and people tend to have very strong opinions about this. Um, I mostly, um, uh, due to um, specific people who've um, counseled me over the years, use the language disabled people. I sometimes use people with disabilities and I'll use those interchangeably a little bit throughout the talk, but I just want to acknowledge that I um, uh, want to defer to the uh, language that people prefer to use to describe themselves. Um, so the way I um, became interested and passionate about some of the issues that are going to be at this conference today is through my son. This is a picture of my son, Colin, who is about to turn 19 years old. He's wearing an orange um, graduation cap and gown because he just graduated from high school. Um, so um, he also has autism. And by being his parent, um, I have become more aware than I ever was prior to being his parent about um, the experiences of disabled people and a lot of the challenges that get faced both in healthcare and other aspects of society. Um, I consider Colin not only my son, but also um, an educator to me. And through him, and then also through um, my work, I've become aware, uh, connected with 
friends, coworkers, um, and other people sought out um, and, and become educated by the perspectives of um, disabled people, people with disabilities in all aspects of my life. Um, so that's really informed a, a lot of how I think about a lot of the issues I'm going to talk about today. Um, and the last year, I've also, also discovered that I have hearing loss. Um, so I'm also starting to experience the world from that particular perspective. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about inclusive health care. And the I definition or, or, or conception of inclusive health care is the idea that people with disabilities have a right to equitable access to health care and full participation in health programs and services, which shouldn't seem like a revolutionary idea, but unfortunately it is, as probably many people in the audience know. Um, it's also um, the premise that healthcare providers, health systems, and society have a moral, ethical, and legal obligation to make healthcare more accessible to full participation by people with all forms of disability. And this involves individual level change as well as policy change, technological change, and societal change on really a transformative level. And we'll talk about what that means throughout my talk. Um, this is from um, a CDC website um, page that I have linked in the bottom of the slides if people want to look at it later, describing seven common barriers to accessing many things throughout society, but particularly care. And those include um, attitudinal barriers um, of, of, of healthcare providers, communication barriers, um, not having interpreters, not having information in ways that people with disabilities can appropriately consume it, physical barriers. Um, there's um, really horrific data on how many healthcare Care facilities are inaccessible to people with um, physical disabilities, policy barriers, programmatic barriers, social barriers, and even transportation barriers to actually getting to care. Um, and again, this probably isn't a surprise to many people on the call, but these are really significant and there's a very substantial amount of empirical data that has been published and in existence for over 20 years to know this is a problem. So it's not new that we know this is a problem. Unfortunately, not enough has been done to solve that problem. There's also an image on the slide of um, a person in a motorized wheelchair. So I come to this um, with my professional hat on as a bioethicist, thinking about how bioethics can help think about um, the inequities and challenges for people with disabilities um, in accessing healthcare. And this is a picture of four columns. And the four columns um, are often used to represent um, are the principles of bioethics, the principles which guide bioethics. And that these four principles are, first of all, autonomy, which is acknowledging a person's right to make choices, to hold views, and to take actions based on personal values and beliefs. The second principle is beneficence, or the idea that we provide benefits to persons and contribute to their welfare, and really refers to an action done for the benefit of others. The flip side of beneficence is the third principle, which is non-maleficence, which is really the obligation not to inflict harm intentionally. This is often represented as the first do no harm principle of medicine. And then the fourth, and I would argue today, one of the most important principles of bioethics for the topic that we're discussing is treating others equitably and distributing benefits and burdens fairly. And when you apply those to inclusive healthcare and to the challenges that disabled people have in accessing care, um, you can think about it this way. Autonomy is about respecting the rights of disabled people to make their own decisions about their healthcare and their quality of life and not have them made for them. Beneficence um, is benefiting disabled people, improving their quality of life and the length of their lives according to their own definitions of benefits. Non-maleficence can be framed as not harming disabled people or denying them care, particularly on the basis of their disability. And then justice is treating disabled people fairly and equitably and allowing them equitable access to care and benefits from care, which unfortunately, as I said, there's substantial data that, that um, they do not have. So um, I'm going to pivot here a little bit with that background to talk about COVID-19. Um, and uh, I, I wish we weren't having to talk about COVID-19, um, but COVID-19, as probably everyone on this call knows, is devastating many communities. Um, but it is truly devastating disabled people and revealing and amplifying health disparities and injustices um, in the disability community, much as it is in other communities that experience injustice and inequities. Um, and the next slide is an image that I'd like to take a minute to describe. Um, it's a print called The Great Rave Off of Kanagawa by the Japanese woodblock artist Hokusai from the early 1800s. And it's this very dramatic image of a wave um, cresting, um, a very large wave um, with blue underneath and white foam on the top. And there are two fishing boats that are sort of caught up in the wave and are clearly going to be swallowed by the wave. And in the background, you can see Mount Fuji as well against the skyline. 
Um, I did a little research about this picture, and this is not, in fact, a tsunami, which is often what people think this is, but it's actually called a rogue wave or a plunging breaker. Sometimes it's also called a killer wave. They're estimated to be 30 to 40 feet tall, which they've measured in relation to the fishing boats in the picture. Um, and a large rogue wave like this is ironically also considered the best kind of wave for surfers to surf. Um, and so um, out of a lot of turbulence, which can be very deadly, as depicted in this picture with the fishing boats, there can also come um, a stable and beautiful pipeline for surfing, creating a transformative experience. So today in this talk, I'm going to try to argue that COVID-19 is like a great rogue wave. It's causing terrible um, destruction. It's affecting more people than others, including those with disabilities, like, like for the metaphor, the people in the fishing boats in these pictures. But it's also creating transformative opportunities for change and for justice. Um, the headlines, um, one of the most striking things for me about someone who's interested in these issues is how much um, uh, the media has been covering the challenges um, of people with disabilities in COVID and how much the headlines have really captured this. There's a headline from the New York Times on the left that says it's hit our front door. Homes for the disabled see a surge of COVID with a number of um, flown wheelchairs who live in a group home and a number of care providers with N95 masks and goggles um, on the steps of an institution. Um, and then, um, uh, um, and then um, there's also a headline um, saying COVID-19 infections and deaths are higher among those with intellectual disabilities. This just came out last week. And um, they showed that in Pennsylvania, individuals with intellectual disabilities and autism who test positive for COVID-19 die at a rate about twice as high as other Pennsylvania residents who contract the illness. And in New York State, that rate is 2.5 um, times. And um, as many of you may be aware, it's also much, much worse in group homes, although it's certainly not limited just to group homes. And um, this means that the death rate in um, people with disabilities or some subsets of disabilities is comparable and in some cases higher than the death rates that are much higher for um, Hispanics and um, Blacks in this country as well. So it's obviously, a, it's a very very, very serious crisis. One of the other um, topics which has been very much in the news since the pandemic began is this issue about ventilator triage. Um, with um, both Italy and New York, there was this clear sense that there were many, many patients with COVID who needed to be on ventilators and that we did not have enough ventilators potentially for everyone and we might not have them and we needed to actually go to, I'm not going to go into detail, but go into the regulations and policies that allow hospitals to make policies for how to triage scarce resources when a state declaration of an emergency medical emergency is made. And one of the things that came out immediately was the fact that many states, um, uh, several states and, and, and hospitals were actually writing policies that were actually being very explicit as well as sometimes implicitly discriminatory against dis dis people with disabilities, um, especially people with intellectual disabilities, but not only people with intellectual disabilities. Stay in, they would explicitly be deprioritized in the pandemic. Um, and there was a, a really um, impressive wave of um, op-eds and other um, articles and um, interviews done with people with disabilities. This is an article by Alice Wong um, from April 4th, 2020, saying, I'm disabled and need a ventilator to live. Am I expendable during this pandemic? Um, this is an article by Ari Neiman um, saying, I will not apologize for my needs. Even in a crisis, doctors should not abandon the principle of non-discrimination. Um, this is a quote from Ari Neiman. And there's a picture of Ari Neiman on the right. Um, he's a visiting scholar at Brandeis and founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And he said, people with disabilities are terrified. They're terrified that when it comes to scarce resources like ventilators, they will be sent to the back of the line. And they are right to be terrified because many states are saying this quite explicitly in their allocation criteria. Our civil rights laws do not go away in the midst of a pandemic. We don't suddenly replace the ADA or other civil rights laws with generalized utilitarianism the moment things get difficult. Um, then um, the next slide um, has some additional quotes about the concerns that people who actually use ventilators at home because of their disability had that if they came to the hospital for care, either for COVID or something else, that their ventilators might be taken away from them. And the picture at the top is a picture of Adrian Ash, who was a wonderful um, bioethicist um, and uh, unfortunately died a number of years ago. Um, and she was saying that she has written that a chronic ventilator is part and parcel of that person and that it's not ethical or appropriate to consider taking that ventilator away from a person with disabilities who needs it. 
The picture below her is Alice Wong, who I mentioned previously, who's founder of the Disability Vis Visibility Project and uses a ventilator. And she says, my vent is part of my body. I cannot be without it for more than an hour at the most due to my neuromuscular disability. For clinicians to take my vent away from me would be an assault on my personhood and lead to my death. Um, I deserve the same treatments as any patient. As a disabled person, I've been clawing my way into existence ever since I was born. I will not apologize for my needs. Um, this is a quote from a wonderful article by Professor um, Joseph Stramundo from San Diego State, um, who is both a philosopher and a person with a disability. And this again was at the end of March. And he said, just because there may not be a perfect non-discriminatory set of rationing criteria for ventilators or other scarce resources, that doesn't mean there aren't better or worse ways of doing triage. And he um, very eloquently pointed to what's called the disability paradox. He said there's a significant body of empirical evidence showing there's a substantial difference between a disabled person's self-assessment and how their quality of life is judged by folks who have never experienced the disability. Some prominent bioethicists even refer to this as a disability paradox. And this goes back to my idea of um, uh, that I mentioned earlier about how beneficence really sh and autonomy should be people with disabilities deciding for themselves based on their own experience what their benefit what the benefits are that they hope to receive from care. So through many of the work done by um, scholars and people writing these articles, but more importantly, by disability advocacy um, organizations um, filing lawsuits, um, there was substantial work to make uh, real um, headway in countering these discriminatory ventilator triage policies. And I don't have time to go into all the work in detail. This is an example of an evaluation framework that was created by a coalition of several advocacy organizations. And I've included the link in the slides. Um, but essentially, um, the Office of Civil Rights, the Office of Civil Rights in the current administration um, actually came out with guidance and, and, and rulings saying that it was completely inappropriate to discriminate um, in triage um, according to disability. And they actually took specific action against specific states um, and specific hospitals, and they continue to do so. So um, I think this is actually a really um, excellent example of a situation where advocacy and use of the law and advocacy actually made a substantial difference in calling attention to discriminatory practices and changing policies in a way that meaningfully affected or could affect the lives of people with disabilities. Um, most states did not invoke the uh, medical crisis uh, statements that would have allowed hospitals hospitals and states to use crisis standards of care, but I think it was still a very important dialogue that happened on a national level. Similarly, advocacy has worked very hard, um, uh, including, again, through the Office of Civil Rights at the federal level, to address discriminatory practices about visitation in hospitals. And visitation is actually the wrong word to use in this case, because um, when COVID-19 started, most hospitals didn't allow any visitors um, to come in with patients, but uh, people with disabilities um, need support people frequently to actually be with them in order to make sure that they get the care that they need. Um, and so there were a number of lawsuits and number of complaints with the Office of Civil Rights, a number of people also advocated on a local level with their organizations. And um, I think there's still work to be done in this area, but um, this is an example of, of a case last week where the Office of Civil Rights worked with some organizations in the state of Connecticut to try to change these policies. And I will say, to say the state of California has issued, um, Department of Public Health has issued guidance to allow um, a, a care, a, a, care assistance or others to accompany people with disabilities when they are patients in the hospital. So I think part of the challenge is um, these are some of the, uh, of the issues that have come up, but we really need to know what are the challenges, disparities, and injustices that people with disabilities, disabled people are facing in this crisis? What research do we need to know to identify that? And, and we need to think about what are the solutions we can try to apply beyond just lawsuits and advocacy. Um, and we need empirical data specifically about those experiences, needs, and challenges of disabled people in the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm going to very briefly share some preliminary data from a project I've been doing with Dr. Megan Halley at the Center for Biomedical Ethics. And we've done an online survey of um, individuals and families with rare and undiagnosed um, diseases and conditions um, who have a substantial overlap. Um, many of those people self-identify as having disabilities as well. And we surveyed um, about 413 people, 274 patients, and 100. 
139 caregivers who we recruited um, from Facebook groups from April to June, so early on in the pandemic. Um, our respondents were primarily predominantly female, non-Hispanic, and white, um, although their incomes were widely distributed. And we um, acknowledge that that is um, a, a limitation of the generalizability of our work. And this is a slide showing a graph of the participant concerns that were brought up um, in the um, uh, survey. Um, about a third said they were concerned that physicians would be unable to care for them. Um, about 40% said they were concerned about being denied essential health care, for example, a ventilator. Um, over half were concerned about being denied the presence of a caregiver. And about two thirds were concerned about contracting COVID in a healthcare setting if they needed to go in to get care. Um, they also talked about limitations and strengths of telehealth. Um, as many people know, um, there have been a lot of efforts to move healthcare visits to televisits whenever possible to reduce the risk of COVID transmission. Um, and one person said that doctor's appointments, um, they were concerned are less thorough via telemed than if they were able to see the doctors in person. Another respondent said, we have tried telehealth with one physician, but the internet connection made it challenging. Um, on the flip side, another person saw the change to telehealth as positive and said, it's actually made my life a little easier. Insurance would not cover telemedicine in our state, so docs did not provide it before. Now, instead of having to drive seven and a half hours one way to see my specialist for 45 minutes or less, I can use a computer to connect and get labs or tests done locally, a huge blessing. So there's some differences and concerns about the limitations and strengths of telehealth. Um, our participants also expressed concerns about the restrictions on caregivers one person said, having only one person at appointments creates stress and difficulty communicating with my husband what is going on with our daughter. My husband lacks a say in what goes on with her care and isn't included in many decisions because he can't be there. Another person said, I worry that as his primary and only care provider that I will become sick and who will care for him. I am also concerned because he is 20 he will be in a situation that I won't be able to advocate for him. And a third person said, frequent hospitalization, even during this time, adds another layer of stress in our family, especially being separated, our daughter needing us to advocate for her, and we can't be there. So that gives a snapshot into some of the concerns that this population express. So I want to call out some really exciting work being done by um, Porna. Kashal Nagar, who's also a part of this conference um, at Gallaudet, um, looking at um, the um, deaf community um, about some of their experiences and concerns in COVID-19. And with her permission, I shared um, some of this work, which can be found on the link that I included on the slides. Um, and it's part one findings from a survey of deaf Americans COVID-19 awareness and risk perceptions. And I chose a snapshot that looks at data about um, COVID-19 information and some of the challenges about what's included in ASL videos for people who need or prefer ASL for communication. And I think this is an excellent example of the kind of research that's going to be need to be done in, in a variety of disabil heterogeneous disability communities to look at some of the challenges that people are experiencing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I wanna take a moment to talk about some of the other critical challenges that I think are relevant to inclusive health and health for disabled people. And um, I particularly wanna talk about disabilities, police violence and race. Um, and I acknowledge that um, for me and probably for many people on the call, this is a, on the conference, this is a very upsetting topic, um, but I think it's important to talk about. On the top left is a picture of an incident involving Charles Kinsey, who is a 
um, uh, a care provider um, and, and a, a black male for a young adult with autism, Arnaldo Soto, Soto who was um, Hispanic. And um, Arnaldo had left his group home and Charles was going to um, uh, get him in 2016 in Florida. Um, and Charles um, was lying on the ground with his hands up, yelling and explaining what was going on. And Arnaldo was sitting next to him holding a toy truck. Um, and uh, despite um, uh, explaining what was going on, the police officers shot Char um, Charles, unfortunately. Um, and um, there was, uh, um, and the police officer was um, found not guilty on two charges of attempted manslaughter, but found guilty of culpable negligence and, and sentenced to um, administrative probation, community service, and writing an essay. Um, and there's a picture of Arnaldo um, playing with his trucks in a happier time on the bottom left of the slide. Um, on the top right is a picture of um, the French family. Um, uh, the French family um, uh, uh, had, I'm trying to move my, um, move my, oh, sorry, move my notes. The French family um, was in Costco um, and their um, son um, was, Kenneth was a, a young adult who I believe was nonverbal and um, became upset in Costco and um, his parents were um, trying to help him and um, an off-duty Los Angeles police officer um, took out his gun and um, shot, I believe, nine shots, four of which hit Kenneth, three in the back, um, and also shot his parents, and Kenneth died. Um, uh, just last week, the Los Angeles Police Commission found that the police officer um, was not, a, I don't, don't remember the exact phrasing, but not operating according to protocol, but no charges have been filed, and um, uh, the Frenches have filed a lawsuit. And I think this is really important um, to bring up and to talk about because um, uh, I think that, um, uh, there's evidence that between one third and one half of all Americans killed by police have a disability. And that, as Pete talked about in his introduction, there's a substantial overlap between inequities due to disability and due to race. And this has obviously been a very important conversation. We've been talking about racism and, and black violence, um, violence towards blacks by police um, in our society. And so I think this is a critical issue for the issues that we're talking about today in this conference and something that we who are involved in healthcare in particular have an obligation to um, get involved in talking about and get involved in talking about how we can actually address this important public health emergency. So I want to um, end with a call to action. Um, I think we really must listen to disabled people, um, especially but not limited to disabled people of color. Um, and I, I think part, how we do that is really important. I think we really need to share um, the voice. And, and again, this is not a new thing for many of the people on this call, but share voices in the disability community, including people on Twitter and in journalism and advocacy who are talking about the experiences of people with disabilities in healthcare and in public health and intersections of their experiences with black people and other people of color. And this should include experiences in seeing a doctor, getting medicine, being full participants in healthcare, but also public health issues that occur outside the clinic, including transportation, mental health, um, safety, and police violence. And I, um, I hope there will be an opportunity for participants in this conference, um, uh, the audience as well, to share those voices so that we can all include the range and diversity of voices that we're listening to and the things that we're learning about. Um, I want to quote my colleague, Dr. Alondra Nelson, to say that from a bioethics perspective, but also in healthcare, I think we must lead with a justice imperative. And this is an image, again, of those four pillars of bioethics. And justice, again, was the fourth principle of bioethics, the fourth, fourth principle. And I heard a wonderful talk by um, Dr. Nelson um, from the Hastings Center last week, and I've included the link to that in my slides. And she talks about needing to embrace a bright, braver bioethics in medicine. She says we need a new paradigm for bioethics, but I think this would extend to all the things we'll talk about in this conference today. And she said, at its best, bioethics enables people and communities that have been objects of scientific scrutiny, technological surveillance, to find spaces to be subjects and agents and empowered people in science and medicine. And she calls for a focus not just on individuals, which is historically what bioethics has often done, but on communities and systems, especially those who are disenfranchised. And I think she was talking a lot about the black community because that's where she's done a lot of her research. But I think this is relevant for um, many disenfranchised communities and those that overlap with racial ethnic minorities, including people with disabilities. 
Um, that other call, I think, to all the participants, and there's such a wonderful diversity of um, people involved in this um, conference, is what um, Congressman John Lewis called make good trouble. And there's a picture of Congressman Lewis and a quote that says, you must find a way to get in the way and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. You have a moral obligation, a mission, and a mandate when you leave here to go out and seek justice for all. You can do it. You must do it. And I think one of the things the other speakers will talk about is that ways on both a micro level as, more, as well as a macro level that we can make a difference in our communities and in our conversations with our colleagues, with our patients, and with our institutions to try to work and lead with a justice imperative when we think about the experiences of people with disabilities in healthcare broadly and COVID specifically. And I think we really need to focus on the transformative potential in the midst of turbulence, as I described with that killer rogue wave and the Hokus Hokusai um, wood carving that I talked about earlier. And um, as many of you probably know, I used to live in uh, Seattle. This is Mount St. Helens. And as many of you probably know, it was recently the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens. And at the top is a picture of Mount St. Helens before it erupted 40 years ago. And at the bottom, and it's a mountain with a peak. And at the bottom is an image of Mount St. Helens after it erupted, where the peak is gone. Um, it's, it doesn't look like the same mountain. It looks substantially different. Um, and, and, and it was really an incredibly dramatic event if you watched any of the things in the 40th anniversary. Um, this is a picture of a, um, another volcano, but it looked very similar after Mount St. Helens, where everything in the landscape is covered with ash. All the buildings, all the roads, all the plants, everything is covered with ash. It looks completely different. And I think COVID-19 is like a volcano. It's completely transforming healthcare. It's completely transforming so many things about our world. Everything is being touched. Just like in this image, everything's covered with ash. Everything is being touched. There's nothing that can hide from the changes that are coming um, related to COVID and the changes that COVID, the things that COVID is re revealing that were inequities that already existed. Um, and this slide is a picture um, from another volcano of what happens after the volcano. It's a picture of a plant with green leaves and some flowers growing out of a gray, cracked, dry landscape out of a, uh, after a volcano. And um, I, I, I don't want to um, uh, be Pollyannish about this, but I really do think there are opportunities for us to call and advocate and make change in new and important ways for disabled people in healthcare um, that come out of these crises that are coming from the COVID pandemic. And I just wanna end with a quote from my friend, um, Paul Stephen Miller, um, who um, unfortunately died in 2010. Um, Paul um, had achondroplasia. Um, at the top is a picture of Paul when he was a professor of law at University of Washington. He was also the EEOC commissioner, AEOC commissioner from 1994 to 2004. And at the bottom is a picture of Paul and Judy Human participating in a protest um, uh, around the time that um, section 504 was implemented with a banner um, and a group of people with disabilities, including in a wheelchair, saying injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, which is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and um, when Paul died um, in one of the articles about him, there was this wonderful quote, which I really use um, as sort of a, a way to frame how I think about the rights of disabled people in healthcare. And he said, when I was born, I know my parents were scared. They looked down at this little shriveled child and they wondered what my life would be like. Would I play ball? Would I have friends? Would I be able to do the things they dreamed that their son would do? And I have played ball a bit. I have always had fantastic friends. I have had good jobs and I have done a good job at them. Along the way, I have helped other people. I have a lovely wife and two beautiful daughters. I have had a marvelous life. And I just want my girls to know that everyone can and must live a marvelous life. And I think really, um, a commitment to inclusive health care means a commitment to helping disabled people to live a marvelous life as they define it. And with that, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'm so looking forward to the rest of the day. I apologize that um, one of my challenges is I speak too fast, especially when I'm passionate and excited about a topic. Um, but I really appreciate um, all of the organizers inviting me and all of you for listening to me today. Thank you. Holly, thank you so much for that talk. Um, wow, you touched on so many important issues. I almost don't know where to start. I will say, I start by just saying um, we need to slow down a little bit and take a deep breath. <laughs> I think we're all a little 
uh, nervous. The captioners are having a little trouble keeping up with us. Thanks to everyone in the audience for their comments to help us make the conference more accessible. Uh, just to let everyone in the audience know, we are recording all of these sessions. They will be available after the conference. There will also be transcripts available. And you should have in your um, the last email I sent out a link to a box folder that has all of our documents in it, including the PowerPoint slides, uh, Word documents um, with the uh, text of the slides, et cetera. So hopefully you guys have access to that. So um, Holly, you, you remember, uh, I think we, you and I talked when this pandemic started and um, I remember just being like terrified as this thing was starting. I mean, I have diaphragmatic weakness. I can barely cough because of my cervical spine injury. And I was convinced if I got COVID, I was going to end up on a vent and die. And the first thing uh, that I did is I, I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going back to the hospital during a pandemic. And luckily my department as always was very supportive and told me that I could work from home. And as a radiologist, I have a home workstation. I can connect to the hospital and read scans on home, at home and uh, just be on Zoom with the residents and fellows to teach them. I wonder if you just might touch a little bit on providers with disabilities uh, during this pandemic and what we can do for them. Yeah, thank you, Pete, for bringing that up. And um, uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but you wrote a really excellent op-ed um, in Just Security about some of these issues. And I'm so glad that you wrote that because I think it, it described the issues well and made um, there be greater awareness about this topic. Um, I, I think, again, it's one of these situations where this is not a new problem. It's just magnified by the pandemic. There are other situations in which um, employers and healthcare institutions do not provide or are not open to providing accommodations for providers that arguably they really should provide um, under um, uh, many of the laws, including ADA, that apply. And I think COVID has really amplified that um, because, as you said, people like you are feeling like this is life and death, um, and they and and it's it's magnified to a the stakes are even higher than ever. Um, and so I think it goes back to the fact that um, uh, hospitals and uh, medical schools and other healthcare settings have to have as part of their policies explicit accommodations for people with disabilities that are done at the systems level through HR and not simply left to the discretion of the supervisor or the department chair. Um, in my experience, when things like that are left to the discretion of the supervisor, it's far too potentially subject to the lack of education or the explicit or implicit biases of the department chair or the supervisor. And it's great that you have a good department, but I'm sure you and everyone else here know of other experiences people have had where that's not the case. Um, and I will say I have heard very well-meaning people who I respect really not understand this issue and not understand how important it is. And, and I think part of the explicit policy should be that HR should be getting a list of accommodations that are needed and then tell the, the people who are the supervisors that those have to be um, uh, implemented and applied. Um, and so I, I think in COVID-19 in particular, we may be able to come up with innovative ways for people like you and others to do their work that don't put them at risk of, of um, illness and death. Um, and I think telehealth yeah. is a great example of that. Yeah, you know, um, I think that it's hard to know if uh, the hospital and the medical school were going to send out information about high-risk providers, because I may have beat them to the punch by emailing them and saying like, this is an issue. Um, but eventually it came down from leadership telling the different departments that this is something they need to be made aware of and to make every effort to accommodate their providers with disabilities. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate. I have a friend who's a radiologist at Mount Sinai 
And out of her group, uh, I think her division, two radiologists actually died a couple mm. months ago. Uh, both of them, well, one I think had asthma and the other one was over age 65. But this was in the beginning of the pandemic. And so, you know, despite the fact that radiology being a little bit protected and away from patients in most instances, uh, you know, we were not immune. And it's very unfortunate that those people didn't ask for or didn't realize that they needed accommodations um, before they got sick. Right. And, and, and obviously, uh, tragically, healthcare providers are getting sick and dying with COVID. So I don't want to minimize the risks and challenges to people who maybe don't have disabilities or would not have requested or, or, or had accommodations. I think that's very important too. Um, and the lack of PPE has obviously been a part of that. Um, but I think um, ways to mitigate risk and allow accommodations is something, I, I, I'm sure this will come up throughout the conference, but it's very, I've learned um, that, you know, um, a, a design and accommodations and approaches that support the needs of people with disabilities tend to also support the benefit of everyone. Um, and so I think this is another example where that is hopefully the case. Yeah, absolutely. Although I have to admit, um, before I emailed my boss to ask if I could work from home, I did feel very self-conscious about it. This was before the stay in, stay at home orders were put in place. So I was like a little, like three days earlier, you know, I was like the only one at first asking for the accommodation. And then by three days later, it was a moot point because they were telling everybody to stay home. But I think that, you know, as a person with a disability, it can be intimidating sometimes to ask for the accommodations. And, um, you know, one can be very self-conscious about uh, not being strong, like I talked about earlier. And I talked to some providers who felt very guilty, very high risk providers who had really no business being in the hospital during a pandemic, but they still felt bad because their, you know, um, colleagues were risking their lives and they were more protected. So uh, there's a lot of interesting emotions wrapped around this. And actually one of our breakout sessions uh, over the noon hour is gonna focus on a provider with a disability. So we'll move on from that discussion because uh, you know people will be doing that hopefully over the noon hour. We did get a question about telehealth, and this is interesting because you and I had talked about this a few days ago in um, hashing out this research project. So Holly and I want to do a project uh, looking at telehealth and people with disabilities during COVID-19, seeing what the experience has been uh, for people with disabilities. And, you know, I think it's going to be different depending on the type of disability. I had my first telehealth visit with my doctor a couple of weeks ago and it was great. I just like sat in front of the computer and talked to him. I didn't have to get dressed up, get in the car, take my caregiver with me, deal with the segue. I mean, it's all of these things with the mobility difficulty were completely eliminated and it was great. But what do you think, of, how do you think different disabilities might be impacted um, by telehealth? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I think partly I want to get empirical data about it, and that's why I want to do this study. Um, uh, I will say that I think, again, it's it's bringing forward an issue that's existed in healthcare for a while. As you said, you going to the doctor prior to COVID was uh, presented challenges to you, not challenges that you're unfamiliar with, but it was not a, you know, you had to go through maybe more steps than uh, some other people do to get to a doctor's visit. Um, I think about it a little bit through an autism lens, just because of uh, my son. Um, and um, the doctor's uh, office and the hospital are not at all conducive to the communication challenges and the uh, sens uh, sensory issues of people with autism. And a telehealth visit can be much improved for at least some aspects of healthcare. And that's something I've talked about for a long time and given public talks about even before this pandemic. So I think, again, this goes back to the transformative potential and turbulence. I think we can rethink 
what parts of healthcare we can make more accessible through telehealth, and then what to do about the parts of healthcare that will require in-person visits and examinations. Um, but that, you know, step one is making telehealth um, reimbursable, which it wasn't really before. And I think the crisis has has made that more possible than it was before. I think step two is is getting providers comfortable doing it. I think a lot of providers felt like there was, like you were talking about the biases that providers have about being strong. I don't mean in a bad way, but you know, the culture is that you need to be strong and you need to be tough. I think there's also a culture that you have to look the patient in the eye, be able to examine the patient with, with, um, you know, in person. And that's certainly true for some things, but I think it's, it's raised the question of, well, maybe we can find some ways to do some of the other kinds of care that are important. I think the other thing that's really striking to me is that our institution and many other institutions, especially in the early days of the pandemic, there were very few patients coming to the emergency room. People were really scared. Um, and the data shows that there were probably people having really serious health issues, including strokes and heart attacks, and not just mild strokes, major strokes, who were not coming to the hospital. And so I think it's really um, a crisis for everybody, not just for people with disabilities, that we need to both make people safe for coming to the doctor in the hospital when they need to, but create avenues for them to, to interact with healthcare providers to get the advice to know when they need to come in when they have to. And it's going to not be, oh, you make an appointment and you come. It's not going to be the same old way we did it. And I think it, I, I think that it's going to change forever. Um, uh, but I think um, what I worry about is people, including with PC, people with disabilities, being so worried about getting COVID, and I totally understand that, that they don't come get the care they need um, and that they suffer serious health consequences that they don't want to have happen because of that. So um, I think it, one of my other sort of calls to action to people on this call, they themselves have disabilities or, or, or know people with disabilities, is it's still really important to go get health care when you think you need it. Um, and I think now a little bit into this crisis, health institutions are doing a better job of trying to make it safe and accessible. There's still a ways to go, but I think it's important. I totally agree. I wanted to also touch a little bit on um, what you described about the intersection of race and disability and how uh, patients with disabilities, especially sorry, people with disabilities, not necessarily patients, um, and especially Black Americans with disabilities are at um, much higher risk of being killed by the police, by other people without disabilities, especially those with mental illness. Um, it's unfortunate that you know, the police have become the frontline mental health providers in our society after the gutting of our uh, mental health infrastructure. And, um, you know, I just, I want to talk a little bit, or I hope you could comment about allyship and how important it is for uh, one minority group, such as people with disabilities, to support another, in this case, uh, Black Americans and the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. It's something I've been thinking about a lot in the last couple of weeks, and I think um, what one of the most important things I've learned is how much I have to learn and much I have to listen to people, which is why I made that one of my points. Um, I think I was aware that there was an intersection between race and particularly being black and police violence with people with disabilities, but I didn't know enough about it. Um, and I think like many people, I hoped there was some form of training that would mitigate it. And I, I, I don't mean to be glib about that. I think training and de-escalation and education is important. But I think the last couple of weeks, um, uh, the important work being done by Black Lives Matter, um, the reactions to the um, murders of um, Black Americans by the police um, and throughout the country in the last couple of weeks, but also over time, it's not a new thing, have raised an issue that it isn't, that it's, 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 it's very disproportionate in who it affects and that we have an obligation, especially those of us who are white and those of us who, um, who identify as not disabled, to, to get involved and to be active. Um, I, there's also been a lot in the discussion of Black Lives Matter about trying to, and the and the 
important work for racial justice in the last couple of weeks that white people should not take over the discussion and try to be the ones who do most of the talking. They need to hand over the microphone. Um, so part of what I'm trying to do, and I have work to do, for, so first of all, I welcome the listeners. If people have important points to make things that we need to learn, people we need to follow, I, I hope there's a mechanism to share that with the organizers and we can distribute that and make it public later because that's part of the work that I'm trying to do. Um, but I, I, I think um, I, I think being and there was a wonderful, um, I'm going to forget her name, but there was a, I'll find it and share it at the, after the break, but there's a wonderful um, activist and advocate who talked about how it's not just being an ally that we have to do, it's actually um, being um, a, um, a, cons a co-conspirator, I think is the language that was used, um, and that we have to be really active participants in systems change. And I think that's very consistent with what I'm arguing about systems change for healthcare for people with disabilities. Um, and I think, um, I, I think we really need, my personal opinion is we need transformative work in that area. So I think reaching out to people who are already doing this work, listening to people who are already doing this work and being brave enough to um, give them a voice and, and, and speak at our local institutions and in our groups about the issues and the intersections. Again, I think people are listening who weren't listening before. Um, it, it, and I count myself yeah. in that. I hope I was listening some, but I'm listening more. And, and we have to take that opportunity. I need to encourage all of our listeners who are disability advocates to really integrate your work into the diversity framework of your institution. Uh, diversity is where all of the efforts are at, where institutions are uh, launching huge initiatives and disability cannot be by itself. It needs to be integrated into the diversity framework and you need to show up for the other minority groups for them to show up for you. And um, so it's very important. We had a protest, you know, at Stanford a couple of weeks ago. And I was fortunate enough through my participation in the LEAD program, which is a leadership excellence advancing diversity, a wonderful program started in the pediatrics department at Stanford. And because I'm a member of that group, I was involved in this email thread where the residents were organizing uh, this protest and it felt really good to even help in some small way to organize that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go because again, I was kind of afraid <laughs> of showing up to the hospital in person, but- um, but, you, but you weren't the only one, Pete, and one of the other things about that protest, and this may have been your work, but is that there was, in all the discommunication about it was a description of how people could participate virtually. Um, and I thought that was really important um, because um, I, I, I've also seen in a lot of Twitter and social media from um, Black disabled advocates um, ways that people can participate virtually in protest because just because you don't feel comfortable or you can't go to a physical protest doesn't mean there aren't ways to protest. So I, I, I think that was really important part of that. Yeah, I, I agree, Holly. Well, we're almost out of time here. Um, I just want to thank you again for that wonderful discussion. And um, just again, to our audience, transcripts and videos will be available uh, after the conference. And um, we will take a 30 second break or so uh, before we introduce Nat Gleason and, uh, and his talk. So once again, Holly, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and please reach out to me, anyone in the audience who'd like to talk more about these things. Thank you for the opportunity.